To the east of Bird Oswald is a lake called Crag Loch. From here, archaeologists have extracted soil samples to construct a picture of how the landscape changed when the Roman troops pulled out. This process, known as pollen analysis, involves examining the types of trees that once grew here. I like trees, which is why I've planted them on my farm. But to archaeologists, the presence of trees on land that had once been farmed shows that the countryside has been abandoned. And in the Dark Ages, the traditional view is that the countryside reverted to a wild wood once the Romans had withdrawn. The work at Crag Loch challenges this view. It was carried out by Petra Dark of Reading University. Pole analysis gives us really good evidence for what the countryside of the past was like. We can actually identify the pollen grains of different plants, like the trees, the cereals, and so on. And we can count the pollen samples taken through cores of sediment and reconstruct vegetation change over long time scales. Petra is able to build up a picture of what the landscape looked like hundreds of years ago. If we get cereal pollen, that tells us that they're growing crops nearby. If we have tree pollen, that tells us there was woodland nearby. And this is very important for reconstructing uh, changes in farming in the past because we can see were they farming very intensively or had areas of land been abandoned to farming, in which case they quite rapidly revert to woodland. By carbon dating the samples, Petra is able to tell when a landscape changed. By the Roman period, this is quite an open landscape, a lot of the woodland's gone. Petra's charts clearly show that at Hadrian's Wall there was not a massive increase in forest when the Romans pulled out. By the end of the Roman period, we start to get an increase of birch pollen. But the other trees are not really changing, so there isn't massive woodland regeneration happening. Contrary to popular belief, the landscape at Hadrian's Wall did not revert to forest when the Romans left. Petra has compared samples from a selection of sites across Britain. While some do see an increase in woodland, at many the land continued to be farmed in exactly the same way. And in certain places, land use actually intensified after the Romans departed. We can't generalise across the whole of the landscape in the way that, uh, you know, in the 1950s, before we had this evidence, there was this generalisation. That's much too simple a picture. Petra's work demolishes the vision of Britain reverting to a wild wood once the Romans departed. In forts like Bird Oswald and towns like Roxeter, the end of Roman administration did not bring about the breakdown of society. Released from the controlling hand of Rome, new leaders emerged and society regrouped. But this new independence did not mean that Britain had cut herself off from the rest of the world. A series of extraordinary contacts were about to be made with some of the most powerful players in the ancient world. At Tintagel, on the Atlantic coast of Cornwall, there is a rugged promontory. This dramatic site has long been associated with the Dark Age warrior, King Arthur. I think this one of the most romantic places in Britain. And I'm not surprised that Arthur is supposed to have been conceived in a castle here. The trouble is, those dramatic ruins over there are 13th century and have nothing whatsoever to do with Arthur or with Camelot. King Arthur first became associated with Tintagel when the author Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote a version of a legend in which King Arthur is born here. The Earl of Cornwall decided to build an Arthurian-style castle on the headland. Tourists have been coming here ever since to catch a glimpse of Camelot. However, the Dark Age story of Tintagel is far more exciting. Excavations here have shed new light on Britain's ancient contacts with the rest of the world. Charles Thomas explains. 
This is the classic way to see it, to approach it, because we've got the island, yeah. we've got that neck there, and you can see most of the important parts. You can see the top, the summit there. In the early 1980s, there was a fairly dramatic fire here, and yeah. the whole of the top of the plateau caught fire. Yeah. The grass burnt, even the roots burnt. We yeah. then had a unique opportunity to examine two or three acres. We found that the top, far from being bare, was covered with the remains, the footings of little yeah. huts. 20 or 30 rectilinear buildings. We right. thought that these were all medieval. We yeah. now know they're post-Roman. We've investigated 10% of the top of the island. We found that the pottery, although burnt, was still recognizable as post-Roman imported pottery. Something had been taking place at the top, not a big scale. At the precise location where writers imagined a Dark Age king being born, modern archaeology had found the remains of a large settlement dated to the middle of the Dark Ages. And this was not all. Trampled amongst the remains of the buildings were thousands of sherds of intriguing pottery. The finds are extraordinary because there were large quantities of wheel-made pottery. None of this was the same as we get in Roman Britain, and none of it was anything that could conceivably be, have been produced here in post-Roman times. Archaeologists thought that the pottery looked Mediterranean in origin. But to be certain, they had it analysed by David Williams at Southampton University. What I did with colleagues is to make a thin section of part of the actual pot, stick it onto a glass slide and grind it down so it's terribly thin. When you put it under the microscope, you can actually see the minerals and the rock fragments in the clay of the vessel. Right. And they will actually reflect what type of geological area the clay came from. So if I look through this, at that slide you've got in there, lots of white bits and, yeah, three sort of pinky things. That's yeah. right. That's serpentine. Oh. That isn't a common mineral at all. Yeah. You do get uh, examples of serpentine around the Mediterranean in western Cyprus yeah. and they also occur just across the coast in southern Turkey. There's a whole string of kilns around there. When we compare them with the Tintagel uh, pottery and it's a, really? almost a dead ringer. David discovered but the Tintagel pottery had been made in one of a series of enormous kiln sites in southern Turkey. So much pottery was produced at these sites that it still lies in huge piles by the side of the road today. These are thick, sturdy vessels uh, that were made for the buffeting of, of sea transportation. They were very heavy indeed. These heavy-duty pots were used for transporting goods such as olive oil and wine around the Mediterranean. The ship that visited Tintagel may well have started from Turkey, perhaps to pick up further cargoes, tableware, micaceous jars, across to the Peloponnese, pick up more amphora, and then to Carthage, where possibly it picked up North African olive oil amphora, plus the African tablewares and from there, possibly, through the Straits of Gibraltar to Tintagel. The big containers, they're really the Coca-Cola tins of their period. If that's turning up in Tintagel, these things don't last forever. The first time some idiot drops it, it's shattered. You can say this is a group of pottery from the Mediterranean which got here in some such period as 530 to 560. Britain was at the edge of a vast trade network driven by Constantinople, the new powerhouse of the ancient world. Power shifted to Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, after Rome was sacked by the barbarians in 410. The Eastern Empire continued to be run here for a further thousand years. But what brought these Mediterranean traders to Britain? What did we have to offer them? 
A discovery in Devon in 1995 provided a clue. Divers looking for the remains of a galleon came across a most unusual find. This estuary yeah. was mistaken as the entrance to Plymouth Sound. And then they'd see this great big expanse of water, and of course you've got this hidden <laughs> reef of rocks. And you hit that lot, I mean, you've had it, haven't you? The first two divers came up to the surface, big smiles from ear to ear, <laughs> with these tin ingots. Ooh, look at that. God, it's heavy, isn't it? Yes, it's pure tin. When we had them analysed, uh, they analysed them at 99.9% .9 pure tin. And this is a clue that they're very old. One theory is there was a boat anchored out there, mm. they were ferrying them out and they turned over on the reef. Tin had been a British export since prehistoric times. It was known to the Romans as the British metal. Is this what Byzantine traders were coming to collect from Tintagel? If you control a large area, you let it be known that by midsummer, the tribute you're going to enforce is X blocks of tin, and you collect a lot of this. And this is something which uh, would be extremely exchangeable in terms of Mediterranean goodies. The tin that the divers found lay a few metres away from a beach which has yielded some intriguing remains. Coastal erosion has revealed hearths where meat had been cooked. Could these be connected to the tin trail? Sam Turner is about to start excavating here. Well, there's several hearths eroding from the cliff. Um, the site's been known about since the 1960s and it's been monitored since and the erosion's got really quite bad recently. Um, in fact, you can see some of the charcoal deposits here in the face of the sand cliff, blackened yes, material. Yes, got the charcoal tail. Yeah, 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 big lumps of charcoal. Yeah. And that's part of a half which extends sort of five or six feet across this area. But, I mean, there's more than just charcoal there. I mean, just looking down here, look there, what's that? It looks like a bit of bone. There's bone from various species here. Some of the bone has clearly been butchered on the site. Yeah. I mean, what's going on? They're right on the seashore. It must have something to do with it. This is probably some kind of seasonal settlement associated with yeah. um, activity that was going on here, probably trading activity. And we know that imported pottery from the Mediterranean has been found at this site with these kind of features. This is the, the kind of trading activity we know is going on all around the Southwest Peninsula at this time. This Mediterranean pottery. Why is it being used on the port? I mean, you don't get champagne bottles being opened in the port of London, do you? I mean, that happens somewhere else. Certainly, I think that this activity must be associated with the social elite. These presumably would be the people who are here uh, undertaking trade, um, using it as a meeting place to, uh, to meet and, and exchange news and, and ideas. Sam's discoveries were not unique. All along the coast, archaeologists are beginning to find evidence for more of this elaborate activity. On this shoreline alone, 500 sherds of pottery and 10 feasting sites have been found. These hearths were the remains of what can only be described as beach parties held on the occasion of visits from Mediterranean traders. Such festivities indicate there was more to this Mediterranean contact than the straightforward exchange of tin for wine. We place different aspects of our lives into clearly labelled boxes. Work, trade, religion, politics. But in the past, these partitions didn't exist. So I don't suppose that the Mediterranean and British traders were there just to exchange goods. These beach markets were to do with something altogether more profound the ceremonial exchange of beliefs and ideas. And some archaeologists even believe that these ceremonies were political.